Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm David Dodick. I'm a professor of neurology and I'm fortunate to be the chair of the American Brain Foundation. Tonight, we'll learn about caregiving and how to support caregivers. Our foundation, as you know, is committed to sharing valuable resources and increasing public awareness of brain disease. Our webinar events like this one tonight are opportunities to connect you with experts in various topics of interest around brain disease. The American Brain Foundation funds research across the entire spectrum of brain diseases. That's what makes us unique. There are many things that makes us, make us unique, but that's certainly one of them because we know that brain diseases are interconnected. By interconnected, I mean that the mechanism that underlies one disease is shared with many other diseases. So that's what underlies our mantra that curing one brain disease means that we'll be able to cure many. We know that tens of millions of Americans suffer from brain disease and other brain disorders. And in fact, so many experience a brain disease or disorder that it's hard to escape it. A friend, a family member, a loved one uh, will inevitably at some point um, experience a brain disease or disorder. And that's why the American Brain Foundation has invested more than $40 million in research grants to almost 300 researchers uh, over the past several decades. So tonight, let's move into our topic of conversation, which is understanding caregiving and how to support caregivers. And I'm very excited to have two fantastic panelists tonight. The first is Bonnie Waters Wattles. She's an executive director for Hilarity for Charity. Hilarity for Charity is a nonprofit organization that focuses on care for families impacted by Alzheimer's disease, including providing 350,000 plus hours of in-home relief as respite for caregivers. Our second panelist is Dan Gasby. Dan is a board member of the American Brain Foundation, and he's the co-author of Before I Forget. And he is a leading voice for Alzheimer's disease awareness and caregiving. So thank you, Dan, and thank you, Bonnie, for being with us tonight and sharing your insights, experience, and your expertise. So let's start. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Bonnie. Let's start by having each of you introduce yourselves. Um, so Bonnie, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Thank you so much for having me um, tonight. I uh, am Bonnie Waddles, and I'm executive director of Hilarity for Charity, which we also call HFC, uh, which was a celebrity founded organization founded by Seth Rogen and Lauren Miller Rogen shortly after Lauren's mom had been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. We've been um, bringing light to Alzheimer's for 10 years now, operating as our own nonprofit charity for the past four years. We've raised about $18 million. And as David said, we fund in-home respite care. That's one of our uh, signature programs. Um, I'm gonna update that stat. We've awarded over 385,000 hours of care. We also offer online support groups um, for family members who have a loved one with Alzheimer's as well as do a number of caregiver wellness programs. Um, and in the past couple of years, we've really focused on brain health education and prevention, um, particularly for young people. We have coursework and uh, curriculum for high school and college students on a platform called HFC Universe, which we launched last year. Um, and HFC Universe was just recognized by Fast Company's most innovative um, awards. Uh, so we got an honorable mention for that. So we're very proud. Um, but we really believe that one of the most advantageous things we can be doing in the Alzheimer's space is educating young people, um, because four in 10 cases may be preventable. So if we could get young people taking care of their brains early on, um, we hope we can move the needle in um, delaying or uh, preventing the disease. Bonnie, thank you. That's terrific. It's a remarkable organization. And um, 385,000 hours, that's incredible. Uh, over a relatively short period of time, that's remarkable work. And you said something very important in there that we'll come back to, That is, and that is that maybe up to 40% of dementia is potentially preventable. So we'll come back to that. But Dan, please 
tell us tell us about yourself. Well, my name is Dan Gadsby. First of all, David, and to the entire uh, American Brain Foundation, thank you for allowing me to express what I've had to endure, but also what I've shared with others now going through this whole process of being a caregiver to someone suffering from uh, the greatest form of dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, the easiest way to, to put my life in perspective is to say this. I was married to a woman named Barbara Smith, better known as B. Smith. And for 28 years, and of the 28, we never had an argument. We worked together as one. We worked five, six, seven days conse consecutively for years. And we produced television shows, magazine, uh, three restaurants, uh, lifestyle products. And we were two sides of a coin. And I could look across the room and see B and talk to her with my eyes. I could anticipate what she was thinking as she could with me. And one day, we, in the height of what we were doing, I looked out over, we had an apartment overlooking Central Park South. And it was the most stunning view. And I said, and I'm not a super religious person, I said to myself, and I said a prayer, I said, God, if this is all I'll ever have, from where I came from, from where Barbara came from, I mean, parents being domestics, you know, working class people, and to reach the height of industry, television, magazines, entertainment, I said, this is, I'll never ask for anything else. And literally about two weeks after that, I started to notice something that I couldn't put my finger on. And that was my wife who I could talk to by just signaling. It was like things weren't connecting. And I took it for granted and just said, maybe she was tired. Maybe, you know, things were, you know, stressful and always are when you're trying to launch businesses and manage people. And what I didn't realize, quite honestly, was if you didn't have modern meteorological technology and a rainstorm comes and you get a band of rain and then you get subsequent bands of rain and you didn't know that a hurricane was coming, that something that was gonna be so impactful that was gonna change your life forever. And that's what Alzheimer's was for me. I couldn't imagine what actually took place on a day-to-day -day basis where things would work and then all of a sudden things would go haywire. And then they'd go right back to being fine. And then they'd go haywire. To the point I, I thought my wife was either uh, having a breakdown or she was uh, bent out of shape and needed to go away, you know, stressful, restful. And the things that subsequently got more and more and more frustrating. And the frustration was that I couldn't understand this woman who literally could do, and I'm not joking, everything with style, effortlessly, with class, who cared about whether it was the president of the United States or it was somebody who was standing on the street corner, she treated everybody equally, was suddenly going through these, these tumultuous types of situations. And we went to a doctor, the doctor said she needs to be tested. We had her tested and then we had, and they found out that she was having cognitive issues. So we decided to go to Mount Sinai and have a beta CAT scan. When we did that, we came out and she looked at me. We walked down Fifth Avenue, I'll never forget it as long as I live. And she started to realize as we were going through this process that was something not right. She would periodically say something like, I'm broken. I'm broken, Dan. I can't understand certain things that I normally could. And we walked down Fifth Avenue from about 101st Street to right in front of the Jewish Museum. And she says, hey, Dan, I know what Alzheimer's is, and I know where it's going to take me. I want you to tell the story, tell the process that I'm going to go through. My wife had a high school education, but she had a PhD mentality. She was one of those people that never got anything easy, but she would work her butt off. 
And she learned about what the disease was. She even knew the, the, the maturation period. She knew everything. And the thing that is so impactful to me and why I'm here today is that she wasn't afraid. She wasn't afraid. She says, tell the story. And that's, that's why we went out and, 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 and put together the book Before I Forget and about all of the tumultuous stuff that goes with Alzheimer's. And so I, I say this to say one of the things that I've learned is that once you're in this cauldron, it changes you. You're never going to be the same. You understand that you live in, in a, a time where you only own your moments. You only own what you can do. How you do that, you do it with intensity, but compassion. You listen, you don't try to win, you don't try to overpower, and you really have come to understand that the toughest thing in life, the toughest language to learn is patience. And understanding that you're, you're not gonna get out of this thing as a winner, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna to try to share and make it better for others that follow you. And so that's why I'm here tonight. And I'm just delighted to have that opportunity to talk to people who are going through it. And even those, because as you said so eloquently, David, uh, before we went on, you know, basically one out of three people are gonna be impacted with some sort of brain malady. And that means that they're gonna either be cared for or have to care for someone. And as long as I have breath, I want to try to make sure that maybe one day before I leave this, this place, Alzheimer's is put in the rearview mirror. And that's, that's the only thing as a testament to a woman who I admired, who I loved, that I know she would do the same thing. And I know she wanted me to do that. And that's why I'm here tonight. Dan, thank you. Um, wow. You know, when I introduced you as a, as a powerful advocate, um, you just demonstrated why, why I said that. I mean, you've been telling B's story for a long time now, and you're here again tonight telling, telling the story again. So thank you so much uh, for being here, and thank you for sharing that story. Thank you. I want to ask a few questions, and then I'm going to turn, you know, turn it over to the audience to ask any questions they might have. And of course, for those of you who have been here at other webinars, you can ask your questions through the chat and we'll get to them, or you can just open your mic and ask a question live. Just raise your hand if you know how to use that uh, hand tool. So maybe I'll ask the first question here. Caregiving has emerged now as actually a public health issue in and of itself. So I wonder, Bonnie, if you could reflect on that and why you think that's why is that the case? Sure. Um, well, first of all, let's start with the numbers. You know, today there are about 48 million individuals caring for an adult family member or friend. Um, of that 48 million, 11.2 million caregivers are caring for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. In the Alzheimer's space alone, that number is expected to triple by 2050. So there's just an onslaught of caregiving needs um, that are being met by the unpaid family caregiver. Um, and there's so much stress on the family caregiver. I mean, the US healthcare system really does put the burden of care on the family. Um, and as people are trying to navigate aging adults um, with their siblings or with other family members, they have to navigate the disease state understand what caregiver roles might be necessary all while they're trying to navigate a healthcare system that is complicated and overwhelming. Um, at HFC, the caregivers that come through our organization often feel overwhelmed and very underprepared for the caregiving journey. Um, mm -hmm. So we try to give tools um, to help them, but there's also a financial burden. Um, you know, let's keep it down to the individual person. Um, there are out-of-pocket costs associated with caring for a family member. And in fact, eight out of 10 people surveyed said that they are um, going into their own pockets to you know, cover the costs of daily caregiving. Um, the AARP did a study in 2021 on out-of-pocket caregiving costs. 
And it's pretty significant. It's about $7,200 a year out of pocket costs. So there's a huge financial burden on families. Um, some family caregivers have to give up their jobs in order to assume the caregiving role or reduce their hours to part-time. And of course that hits um, communities that are historically marginalized, um, lower income um, and people with less education often have to give up work to care for somebody that they um, love. Thank you, Bonnie. You know, Dan, you, you gave us a glimpse. I think your comment was when you when you're in the cauldron, you never come out the same. Um, can you talk to us about, you know, your experience as a caregiver, the ups, the downs, just tell us about your experience. Caregiving is one of the most mind bending, surreal, frustrating, exhilarating, and lonely experiences that one person can go through when just as a one-on-one, -on -one, when you are caring for someone else, you're living half a life because everything revolves around that person. I tell people quite candidly, it will make an atheist pious and it will make a pious person an atheist. There's not a day or a week or a moment that you don't go through the situation of saying, why me? Why am I missing all of the things that I should naturally be able to do? Why am I having to take care of changing sheets, watching someone destroy things, watching someone lash out, watching someone turn the gas on and you're not paying attention, it could potentially blow up the house. Or in my one particular situation, uh, my, my, my wife dropped the glass and I stepped on it. And for six weeks, I had a problem with my foot. And the reply to that whole situation, I laugh now, was after she dropped the glass, after I went through everything, had to go get stitched up at a local clinic, she said, uh, she would ask me while I was trying to clean it, are you okay? And you wanna go, no, I'm not okay. You dropped that glass. You caused me to go through this. But the only thing you can do is say, yeah, honey, I'm okay. You know, lying is not something that we should be taught to do. But in the case of being a caregiver, you're constantly manufacturing, man, you know, massaging and outright lying. How do you feel today? Well, I just got up three times tonight to change your diaper or change this or, or move this around. And how are you doing, honey? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine, babe. And you're not fine. Or they ask you a question that you know, am I going to be, am I going to get better? And he says, you're going to, you're just fine just the way you are, knowing the situation is not true. And so I say to caregivers, you have to be able to know that you, you, you can't tell them the truth. You can't say, I'm tired of this or you're making me feel this way, or I wish I could go somewhere. You know, the toughest thing about being a caregiver to me was I couldn't wait to get away. And when I was away, I couldn't wait to get back. So you're in this, this, this tug of war emotionally about needing time off. And at the same time, wondering and worrying about when you're not there, Who's handling that, that person you love? Mm -hmm. That's a, it's wow. a very, it's a very, you know, you're constantly, David, I have seen people who walk away from their loved ones or call me or text me and say, I just can't do it. I can't do it. And everyone, just like everyone shouldn't have a child, everyone's not necessarily meant to be a caregiver one-on-one. -on -one. It takes a lot of intestinal fortitude. It takes a lot of patience. And it takes, at times, you, you, you're self-sacrificing. So I, the, 
the thing that you have to do is be honest with yourself. Uh, I made a commitment. I looked my wife in the eye that day after we left Mount Sinai, but we, we talked about caregiving years before that, just as part of a, a, a loving relationship. You know, healthcare proxies, what do you wanna do? Adjusting wills, because we did not wanna go through when you like something, you have to you have to like who you love, and when you do that, you're not afraid to talk about the things that are the difficult things because it puts them it puts them in a place that they don't need to be discussed because you know what's going to happen. I think the toughest thing also, and I still I get calls every so often, is when you're a caregiver. In the, you know, it's sort of like you're going into war and the, the captain or the, whoever is the lead person and there's five family members or five people in a regiment. And they says, you know, this is gonna be a tough situation. You may not come out of this the same way you, you go into it. And whoever feels they can do it, step up. Well, in many familiar situations, it's not the person who steps up. Everybody steps back and you're left as the caregiver. You're left as one to take the hill, to charge, you know, to charge up the up the mountain. And then at the same time, while you're the one left with the responsibilities, everyone else is now free to provide comment, even though they're not getting up at two o'clock in the morning, or they're not working, uh, uh, working a job and coming back or having to do all of the things. And they're not missing a Friday night or a Saturday night or you know, they can't watch a TV show or whatever their lives, but they can comment. And that's one of the tougher things about being a caregiver. And that's what I get feedback from people all the time about the family situation. Five people in the family, three or four siblings, one does everything, the other three or four are crit a, a, a critique and criticize. And, but nobody wants to step up, but everybody wants to make a, make a statement. And so it's a, being a caregiver is, is like taking all the shots and not getting any of the ability to, shoot, to, shoot, to hit that. You, you absorb a lot. Yeah. Yeah. David, I'll just pipe in. Um, I saw Jane put a question in the chat. It is true that the life expectancy of caregiving, especially for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia, um, the caregiver life expectancy is reduced. I think it's by four to eight years. Yeah. Um, and also caregivers in the Alzheimer's space, um, you know, experience so much anxiety, you know, it's, I'm trying to normalize it. I don't want to scare everybody, but, you know, they experience depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and other mental health issues. Um, and so by talking about it and by Dan sharing his story and by, you know, Lauren and Seth sharing their story, we're hoping to create a narrative that um, people aren't afraid to get help or to ask for help or to get a diagnosis. Um, so we just keep need to keep sharing our story and normalizing this conversation so that people can feel supported either by their family, their friends, their communities, um, or organizations like the ABF or um, HFC and, and Alzheimer's Association, many other great organizations out there. People who care give tend to be uh, less able to manage their immune systems are, are, are really uh, uh, weakened. They tend to get sick more often. They tend to heal more slowly and they tend to uh, not take care of themselves and, and go sort of like a, a what is me, it doesn't matter. They go into an, automos an automaton situation where it just things just sort of constantly evolve, just to just spin. And, and, and so you're, you're right about that. And uh, I've talked to people, you know, I mean, if there's one good thing about what I had to go through is that I try to let other people know that you're not alone. And, and we're sitting on a, on, a, on a time bomb. You know, when you think about people who get this disease or older, every day, you know, 65, uh, 10,000 people in America are turning 65. Every 66 seconds or 63 seconds now, whatever it is, is a new 
person with just Alzheimer's alone, not the other forms of dementia. And what people don't realize is if you divide that 60 plus seconds into all the seconds in a week, every week there are 10,000 new cases of Alzheimer's. And if you say one or two people are gonna be managing their care, that means every week in America, 30,000 people are being dealt this new and unbelievably difficult disease and situation. That's a, you know, if you said 30,000 people in, in most situations with a disease or a virus, I mean, billions of dollars would be poured into it immediately and we would be finding a cure, you know, uh, that's what we're dealing with. Well, Dan, <laughs> those are uh, striking numbers, actually. When you put it that way, there's a question in the chat here. It says, why is there no movement to get Congress to provide more help, financial, educational, otherwise, for family caregivers? Like, where is, what is the status of that? Who's doing the work to help try to shift and change policy? Well, first of all, you know, people with Alzheimer's are not the ones who are going to lobby Congress. So that's, that's part of the problem. And they tend, to, obviously, they're, they're older population. And a lot of people, I mean, you know, we were talking off camera earlier. I mean, there are a lot of people who, st who still don't really understand what Alzheimer's is, you know, and they just think it's memory loss. And I mean, we've made giant strides in ABF and so many other organizations like Hilarity have done in terms of raising awareness, but we're still on the back bench compared to what the amount of money and efforts that have been poured into, and rightly so, you know, heart disease, uh, kidney disease, uh, cancer. I mean, you know, their, their amount of fundraising, which is the bellwether for how you want to get appropriations through Congress, uh, we're, still, we're still two, three, even four X down from what they're, uh, what they're doing on those other specific uh, diseases. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, anything to add? Yeah, I just think we have to change the narrative around aging. <laughs> and that that's, you know, and we have to value aging and value caregiving. Um, and we, you know, as soon as Congress realizes that we're all caregivers at some point, you know, maybe we'll have some attention to this. Um, and we just want to start to talk about receiving care and talk about how we want to be cared for as early as possible. Um, one of the things HFC has recently done was partnered with our friends at Caring Across Generations um, on a culture change project uh, that involved the show, This Is Us. And we had some of the cast from This Is Us, including Mandy Moore, Chrissy Metz, John Huertas, sit down with Lauren and Seth and um, Ai-Jen Poo, who is a warrior in the care space, um, to talk about you know, how they portrayed Alzheimer's caregiving um, and the family dynamics on in such a public forum um, in that TV show. And so those videos live on a, our website um, called Conversations. We'd have to look conversations.care backslash this is us. I'll pop it in the chat. But you know, the more we can break through the noise and the clutter of the media, but really like draw attention to the Alzheimer's crisis. Um, the more attention we will get um, in Congress. Yeah, there's a, a really good conversation going on in the chat and people are talking about the RAISE Act, uh, which apparently is a, an act, a bill that's before Congress now. So there's, uh, there are things that are happening. You know, Bonnie, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that there are 47, 48 million caregivers right now in the United States. That's a lot for hilarity for charity to manage, obviously. And you've given 385,000 hours, but that, and, and that's a massive amount, but seemingly a drop in the bucket when you consider the needs of those 48 million people. So how do you prioritize who you provide services for, and what do those services look like? What happens in those 385,000 hours? Sure, happy to talk about it. Um, I'll just clarify that 48 million is total caregiving, um, not just in the Alzheimer's space. So we provide 
grants uh, for respite care and our other programs for families that have someone with Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, our care grant program prioritizes uh, families that one, have a professional diagnosis of, an, of Alzheimer's or related dementia, uh, and also display some financial need, um, and really uh, prioritize homes where there's very little external help. So many families are very isolated, caregivers are very isolated and doing this all on their own. Um, and given our limited resources, that's who we prioritize. I wish I had a magic wand and can raise hundreds of millions of dollars because the need is endless. Um, and we make, um, I don't, but there's external uh, volunteer grant review committees that review the grants on a monthly rolling basis. So the way it works is people would fill out the application within a month that would be reviewed and then they would be notified whether or not they got a grant. We have two different lengths of grants. One is a what we call respite recharge, which is uh, 50 hours to be used over the course of three months. And then we have a long-term grant, which is 25 hours a week, every week for six months. Um, so we give out fewer of those, obviously, because they're much more costly. Um, but we tend to get people applying. I urge anybody to apply. Um, so please reach out to us. We, and we also have a lot of other caregiver resources on our website, um, as well as online support groups, which are free and run by licensed uh, facilitators. And um, it, you know, these, it's just difficult to make the decisions, but we try to do it as best as possible. And I will say yeah. that we did um, an impact study last year where we surveyed all of our uh, care grant and support group participants for the, from the past 10 years, actually. And we were very happy that to see that respite really can improve the quality of um, care that the caregiver gives, as well as alleviate stress um, and reduce feelings of isolation and make and result in caregivers feeling more physically and emotionally prepared for the caregiving journey. So I just urge any caregivers on this call, if there's any way you can get some respite, whether it's through us um, or through other family members or other services in your area, it's really, really worth it. Bonnie, I, I can tell you that during the, the height of the storm, one of the things that I had to do was I would go sometimes in a parking lot or at the time I was living there on the beach, I would go and find a place and I would scream. I would scream and I would yell and curse and say, why me? I'm tired of this. I can't take this anymore. This is unfair. I can't, I don't want to do this. And I would get it out of me. But then I'd go back. And you have to have the ability to find things that allow you to decompress. You know, I mean, I started hitting a heavy bag. Uh, I would run up hills. I mean, I did a lot of stuff because it's a thankless, thankless job. And, and I have to say this, when you were or are so close to a person, you're, you're, you're the other side of that coin. You're, you're the two hands. You know, if you put them together, all of the, uh, the markings fit. That's the way I was with my wife. I love that woman. I like that woman and I admired that woman and we could communicate non-verbally. She'd look at me, I'd look at her and, and we, were, we were gone. We, we knew just what we wanted to do. And to watch that, that flake away and get to that point where you realize it's not something that could be reversed. And then it goes into that almost surreal, maddening world where the person literally is, they're gone, but their, physical, their body is still there. And you keep reaching back. You would keep reaching back and you'd see little glimmers, almost like the way of, the movie, uh, Perfect Storm, where you'd see the light and then the light would close and, and, and I guess, you know, uh, the actor, uh, George Clooney says, she's not gonna let us out. 
when you, you get to that point where you realize this is, this is it, this is, we're coming to the end and it's miserable. You have to find things that you can do that allow you to, like a, uh, a pressure cooker to, to let the steam out. And no one, unless you've been in that, that, that cauldron, can understand it. You know, it's sort of like no one can really appreciate water until you're in a desert. <laughs> and that's what you're in. You're in a desert and there's no water, but you've got to look for an oasis. That's what, that's what you have to deal with. And anyone who's probably out there, they know exactly what I'm talking about. They know exactly how that, that feeling of emptiness, loneliness, alienation, unbelievably absurd situations that you couldn't even describe, that a science fiction writer couldn't describe what you've experienced. You have to, you, you have to play games to get yourself through it. You're in a, you're in a, you're in a tornado. So Dan, you know, you said that people reach out to you all the time, as I know that they do. And if someone reaches out to you and says, Dan, you know, my spouse, my loved one is just diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. What are the key pieces of advice you tell that person? Well, first of all, I, I, I'll point them that, that there are resources and organizations that you can go through. I talk to them or I tell them, look, you know, you've got to deconstruct things and you've got to just take things bit by bit and don't look at the whole situation. And I also quite candidly say to them, look, I'm going to tell you, don't necessarily depend on your family. It's a tough thing, but most people don't want to deal with this. And you've got to realize that it's going to be you and you may you find a friend, somebody that's really your family in terms of being there for you. Talk to them, tell them exactly how you feel that you can trust. I'm tired of this, I can't take that. You've got to get it out because if you don't, it just, it percolates and it boils over and it eats you alive. Uh, it makes you angry, it, it makes you short-tempered, it makes you not, when somebody is worried about whether or not you know, they, they have the right shirt on. You know, if you knew what my problems are, you know, instead of saying the man who, who complained about his shoes until he saw the man with no feet, you know, you sort of, you, you, you become, you, you can become very short tempered and understanding that most people don't have a clue what you're gonna be dealing with. So you have to find ways to, to exercise, to doing things, self-improvement, through meditation, through catching quick naps, because it's a marathon. It is a marathon. Bonnie, um, there's a question in here. How long is typical from the time the diagnosis is made to the time one needs full-time caregiving? So what do you tell people? What does HFC tell people in response to that question. And Dan, then I'll ask you what your personal experience was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, what I've heard our science advisors say is when you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, you've seen one case of Alzheimer's. And so we can't really predict the progression of anybody's individual journey. Some of it can accelerate very quickly. I think we just don't know enough about the different forms of dementia. Um, so unfortunately I don't have a great answer to that. Um, but I do think, again, it's important to have those conversations early on, um, especially when you get the diagnosis I saw in the chat much earlier. Um, I think it was Terry asked, how do I tell my husband's parents? I mean, I just think honesty is the best policy because there's so much life left to be lived upon diagnosis. And so really living every day and, you know, making the most of what you have every day. Um, but again, in terms of caregiving, having those conversations early on so that uh, the care recipient and the caregiver can plan, make a plan for what is appropriate for them and their personal situation. 
-hmm. You know, it's, it, you, Bonnie, you said it right. It, it's, an, it's like a fingerprint. Every person responds differently given their diagnosis. In, in my particular case, my wife was in superior shape because she worked out and I, and we would walk, she would get on a treadmill and we would talk. And the doctor said that she probably lived two or maybe three years longer than she could have if she had been institutionalized because we got to a point where she started to lose weight and we were giving her four to 5,000 calories a day. I mean, we, you know, it's sort of like if you're 90, why worry about whether or not you're smoking two cigars a day, <laughs> you know? And so we would, you know, we would put butter on bread, she would have milkshakes, you know, we gave her, and, and, and she maintained her weight until that time when her brain said, it's time to, to, to go. And then no matter what we gave her, she, she either wouldn't eat it or then she eventually just shut down. And it was the most frustrating situation and, and, and we, we brought hospice in. And, 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 and I must say that, that these hospice organizations are great, like the Eastern Long Island Hospice is fantastic. Uh, they take you through the whole process, but it, it's, it's, you know, she would be great and then it was almost like then she would drop and then it would, she would maintain that for a while then she would drop and then in a week or so she could drop two or three levels and you just it's a roller coaster that's why it's so difficult for the caregiver because you expect certain things and then all of a sudden there'd be a moment of clarity that you didn't experience in months or years and you don't want to get your hopes up and after seeing those cl those clear points and moments after going through one or two in the early initial stages and then going through subsequent ones, you realize this is just a moment. This is just a situation and it's not going to stay that way. You know, talking about things that we talked about years ago or looking at something that we were working on and coming up with an idea and it was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Thanks. I couldn't get that myself. And then she'd go back into the clouds or back into the fog. So the caregiver has to be aware that this is a this is an emotional roller coaster with with no no guard. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna fly out of that 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 chair, and you just got to pick yourself up and get back in it because you're on you're on the ride for the long run. You know, Dan. Somebody asked, and you kind of answered this, how long you took care of your wife. Obviously you took care of her from, from day one, right. but I guess perhaps that what they may mean is how long was the period of time that you, the well, care this, this, in, intense yeah. and continuous? Well, let me, let me put it in, in bold relief. You know, looking back, she showed signs of Alzheimer's 12 years till, till her, her, her death, 12 years. In reality, the last two and a half, three years were just god awful. Yeah, you know, you know, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was miserable. It was truly, and that's the thing. You have to be honest. If I get, like, if, if I get no nothing out of this in terms of reaching people, just say it because it will. It, you can't shine something that's not shinable. You have to, and for yourself and for others, because you're going to meet people. Once you start going through this, you're going to meet people who are in the dark, in the shadows, and they're going to come out and you're going to know that you're doing something good for them because you're shining a light on this thing. And, uh, and that's why I'm here tonight, because I, I don't want... You know, I don't. This is this is tough stuff. This is tough stuff. Bonnie, you mentioned earlier that maybe up to four out of every ten cases could be preventable. I know the Lancet Commission. I think a couple of years ago actually published a paper suggesting the same thing that maybe forty percent of cases of dementia and Alzheimer's disease is preventable. How do you frame that? 
in your education and in your awareness? Uh, ed yeah, I mean, we really are on a mission to let people know that your brain is actually a part of your body that you can take care of just in plain and simple terms. Everybody knows now that there are things you can do to maintain a healthy heart um, or to reduce your risk of diabetes. Um, but really we don't think about our brains at all. We go to the, your primary care physician and they don't do a cognitive test when you're my age or younger. <laughs> um, but really we should be thinking all through our lifespan, starting with young people, um, that your brain is definitely something that you can actively take care of. We generally tell people, you know, we have five pillars of brain health, you know, AARP has many more than that. Um, but, you know, it follows kind of the heart health pattern of exercise, nutrition, good quality sleep, um, being socially engaged and being cognitively engaged. That's really what we focus on for young people. Um, there are lots of other things we can be do, um, including taking care of other um, medical risk factors such as hypertension and cholesterol levels. Um, but we focus on sort of the lifestyle factors of, of maintaining a healthy brain. And I think also one of the things is, is to is to meditate. You know, all of what was used to be called hippie stuff has now been basically shown to be good for you to 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 reboot your your brain. And I mean, I, every morning I get up, and I get up most times, and either immediately at the bed or I'll go into the bathroom or whatever, and I will sit and just try to clear my brain, even if it's for like two or three minutes, and not think about anything. Right. Close my eyes. Yeah, Close emotional. My eyes. Sometimes I can do it longer. Sometimes it's a minute, a minute. But I don't think about anything. It's sort of like your brain is like a computer, and you and you close your eyes, you, you stay still, you know, you're just there. And I always feel a little bit more refreshed after doing that. But it's, you know, and, and when weight is such an important factor, being overweight, having belly fat is such an important factor in uh, impacting your ability to, uh, to stay healthy. But you know, one of the things I wanna say is what most people don't realize, and I, I've called it uh, Alzheimer's and dementia is a 21st century civil rights issue. You know, two out of three people have Alzheimer's or women. And African-Americans and people of color tend to get it even between one and a half to two times more likely. And that impacts your entire financial, social lifestyle, second, two generations. If you've got to take care of somebody, you may not be able to take, take the, 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 the children to, to college or to have a second home or to have additional income or to have a buffer in, in good and bad times. Uh, and th this, is a, this is a tsunami and you said it rightly, you know, uh, Bonnie, I mean, by 2030, this thing is, the tide's going out now, but when it comes back in, if we're not better able to manage and mitigate this disease and find a way to stave it off or eradicate it, it's, it's gonna wreck the entire uh, healthcare system. You know, cause people, yep. the good and the bad news is that people are living longer. And the longer you live, you know, I, I think there's a statistic out that if you're 85, you have a one in three chances of having Alzheimer's. If you're black, you have a one in two chance. That's almost like, a, that's a coin flip. Hmm. So to get to that point and to be, and to be successful or whatever, or to retire and then have to spend all of your resources, time and treasure to manage is something that is, it's, it's, a, it's Alzheimer's is, is a terroristic act in the family. It terrorizes people. You can't negotiate with it. It's a tough, tough thing to deal with. And that's why, you know, what the ABF is trying to do. And that's why, quite honestly, when I looked at this thing and I talked to my wife back, way back when, I wanted to be in an organization because I understood that Alzheimer's is tied into epilepsy and tied into Parkinson's, and to Lewy body, and to a whole host of diseases. You know, most people don't realize that your eyes don't see, it's your brain. 
Most people don't realize your nose doesn't smell, it's your brain. Your ears don't hear, it's your brain. All of those things reside in that three and a half pound thing above your eyebrow and below your scalp, you know? And uh, I realized that I wanted to be involved in something that made sense collectively because I think we're starting to do a better job of marketing. It's, as you said, Bonnie, and you did too, David, we take the brain for granted. We just, we, we you know, if, if the body was a car, you know your eyes are headlights, you know the engine's your heart, you know, and you can go through all the other body parts. But the one thing that makes a car go is the driver. Without that, it's just a giant paperweight. And the brain is the driver. And that's why I feel so adamant about telling people how important it is to push people to talk to their legislators. You know, when we did that book, before I forget, we dedicated it to the United States Congress. And it was a specific reason because the, the funding was so paltry. And the more I talked to people, the more I started to understand, you know, this is what she would have done. This is what my wife would have done. She would have said, you don't start at the bottom, go to the top. That's where things are gonna happen. Build up from the bottom, but go to the top and try to make a meet in the middle. And so it's important that uh, what the ABF, what the Alzheimer's Organ uh, Foundation, Association, you know, us against Alzheimer's, all of us collectively keep the pressure on because the tsunami is coming and nobody's yeah. going to be spared. You know, I really uh, appreciate the conversation around brain health. I think we are now where heart disease was over half a century ago when they started talking about heart disease, heart health, heart healthy diets, cardiac coronary artery disease prevention, the whole you know, area, the whole field of preventive cardiology was born. Do you know that just two years ago, the World Health Organization established a brain health unit with a brain health director two years ago. And for the first time ever this year, World Brain Day is being dedicated to brain health. So the conversation is beginning. A global conversation is beginning where heart disease was 50 years ago. It's now starting for the brain. So to the point that you made, Bonnie and Dan, that we can do something. We can do lots to, to, to look after our brain, to optimize our brain health, to reduce the likelihood, even for those at risk, genetically or otherwise, we can do a lot to prevent the onset of or indeed the occurrence of Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. And if we just did the simple things right, almost 75% of the population in the United States is overweight and almost half are obese. And we've got a plethora, forget about exercise and diet, but we've got over a plethora now of new blockbuster treatments, anti-obesity treatments, and less than 1% of the population is taking them. So all of these major diseases that substantially increase the risk for cognitive aging and for brain disease are predictable, they're preventable, and they're identifiable at the very early onset. And to the other point you made, Bonnie, a lot of people don't realize that Alzheimer's disease begins in the brain 15, 20, 25 years before the onset of symptoms. And in, ne in neurology right now, we're like most other specialties, we're very reactive. People come into our office and saying, I think I'm getting a little forgetful or dad's getting a little forgetful. And then we start, like you talked about, Dan, the investigations, you know, we need to work this up. And then the diagnosis is made. And then, you know, we do the best we can. Instead of, we can actually detect with a high degree of accuracy, who's at risk and institute really, really aggressive preventive treatments to prevent that person who is at risk from going on to developing that disease. So um, I, I think there's a, there's a new conversation beginning. There's a new era of brain health that's just beginning. And I think 
for the foreseeable future, I think uh, obviously an awareness and a global education program needs to take place to educate people about how they can optimize their brain health and that these diseases are preventable. So there's a lot of catch up work to do, but you know, I'm very optimistic that the conversation is now starting. That, there wasn't a question there. I was just sort of extemporaneous <laughs> comment. I couldn't resist. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for Bonnie or Dan? Um, please feel free. Don't be bashful. Don't be shy. Open the mic. There's just tremendous conversation going on in the chat. I wish I could read it all, but I can't. But if anybody would like to make a comment or ask a question, please do so. Hi. Um, does speech therapy or occupational therapy, is there any data that that's helpful for the early onset before the person's really lost skills? I, Did you hear me? Yes. I am not. Bonnie, would you like to? I'm not the person to answer that. I was going to punt it to you, David. Yeah. So believe it or not, there are sort of really advanced tools. And I, I'll just give you an example. You, you mentioned speech. So Muhammad Ali's Parkinson's disease, for example, probably could have been diagnosed 15 years before he actually developed symptoms. So there are tools that you just give a speech sample. Like the neurological diagnosis right now is you come into my office for a general medical examination. I do the neurological examination. Actually, there are no, there are no sort of brain health evaluations. So for a 35 or 40 year old person, they don't come in for a brain health evaluation. I think that's gonna change in the future. But if you come in just for a general medical evaluation, you get your reflexes tapped. You may be asked a few questions, but you really don't undergo a brain evaluation. Part of the brain evaluation, I think, should be an evaluation of speech because speech and language changes in very subtle ways that neither you as the person or the people around you even recognized. But there are tools available now that can actually recognize subtle changes in speech well before the onset of symptoms. So it's, it's things like that that are very objective, quantitative, that measure speech, that measure smell, olfaction. You know, patients with Parkinson's disease, for example, a decade or more before the onset of their symptoms start to lose their sense of smell. And I'm just giving examples. So there's a, there's a really refined way and very objective way we can go about examining the brain on an annual basis um, to identify warning signals and flags that should alert us that say, hey, something's going wrong here. You know, dad's, you know, my, my partner is moving in bed when they're dreaming and I take them in for evaluation and they're losing their smell. Well, guess what? There's an 80% or greater chance that they're going to develop Lewy body disease or Parkinson's disease. So we can predict with a high degree of accuracy well before the onset of symptoms, who's at risk. And that would be fantastic to know because as therapies become available, like this year an FDA approved drug became available for Alzheimer's disease, notwithstanding the controversy, that means that we're on the precipice of more treatments to come, it's going to be very important to know who's at risk well before they develop symptoms. So to your question, I'm off on a little bit of a tangent now, but if we could recognize subtle changes in speech before it became obvious to everyone, yes, when it becomes obvious, speech therapy can be helpful. Cognitive linguistic therapy can be helpful. Um, but by the time people develop such profound speech or language deficits that it becomes evident to the person and to everyone around them. It really becomes about palliating um, and optimizing their speech and language for as long as you can. But I think the goal, the future of neurology, the future of the brain is going to be in detecting pre-symptomatic disease, identifying people who are at risk very early on and initiating very aggressive preventive measures to prevent them from progressing and identifying people who, because they're at such risk, getting them involved in clinical trials. I heard a wonderful presentation the other day from one of the world's experts 
in Alzheimer's disease, who happens to sit on our board. And he reiterated the fact that initiating a treatment for Alzheimer's disease when the brain is full of plaques and tangles is probably not the time to be initiating that treatment. The time to be initiating treatment is early on when before symptoms even begin, because you, you can prevent the progressive neurodegeneration that occurs. So I know I've taken a little bit of time in trying to answer that question. Uh, I hope I've I hope I got to your question, but I do think it's important that people understand the importance of doubling down on preventing brain disease by optimizing brain health, and you should speak to your physician about it. We actually are at time, and I just want to say to Bonnie and Dan, um, I've done a lot of these webinars. This was a really, really impactful one, um, and I got to Really thank you, Bonnie, for the work that you and Hilarity for Charity are doing. Um, it's really remarkable. Uh, keep it up. Um, these caregivers need you. And Dan, what can I say? You've been, you've been ringing the bell now for a very long time, ever since I've known you for the last half a dozen years, and you've been doing it long before I met you. So uh, keep it up, Dan. We're very grateful and, and privileged to have you on our board. Um, and thank you for being here tonight and for, for sharing your story. Um, happy to do it thank you for inviting me yes thank you both and before we say goodbye i just want to just give you a sense of what's upcoming in terms of future webinars we have one coming up on cure one cure many where dr francis jensen who's a professor and chair of neurology at penn and also a board member of the American Brain Foundation will be talking to us on the link, the mechanisms that link brain diseases. Um, we'll hear um, a presentation on deep brain stimulation, which is being used for a number of neurological diseases now. Uh, we'll meet some of the researchers that we've funded through the American Brain Foundation, an incredible group of young clinician scientists who are doing phenomenal work. Um, and then another presentation on managing Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis and many more, uh, but this is just to whet your appetite. So thank you very much. Please consider donating to the American Brain Foundation and to Hilarity for Charity because it's your dollars that help drive the research and help drive the, um, the caregiver care that groups like Hilarity for Charity are, 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 are doing. So Please, every dollar counts, and we gr very grateful for your donations. So have a wonderful night. Thank you for coming tonight. Look forward to seeing you next time.